today our topic shall be management of deep queries. So these will be the contents for today. Now coming to, uh, before coming to deep caries lesions, we should know what is dental caries. So dental caries is a multifactorial microbial disease that leads to a cavitation in the tooth structure. In easier terms, we can say that deep caries is simply caries that has progressed into dentine and is either very near to the pulp or is already involving the pulp. So deep caries lesions, uh, if we define them, they are those lesions in which caries penetration is easily observed in the dentine and may involve more than one half of the dentine thickness between the DEG and the pulp. So if we want to classify it, it can be either deep carious dentine lesions or extremely deep lesions. In deep carious dentine lesions, these penetrate radiographically into the pulpal quarter of the dentine. And uh, that is when we see in the radiograph, as we can see in the image over there, there is a well-defined uh, zone of calcified and radio-opaque dentine that separates the infected demineralized dentine from the pulp. While in extremely deep carious lesions, they penetrate the entire thickness of dentine, there is no radiopaque zone and that, is, um, that means the uh, caries is involving the pulp. Now effects of caries on a pulp dentine organ. So any caries process will have some distinct forms of irritants. First is the biological irritants, then chemical irritants and physico mechanical irritants. So the biological irritants are the microorganisms and the various metabolites. We have chemical irritants which are acids and we have physical mechanical irritants which are the various thermal injuries etc. So once these irritants act on the pulp, they lead to the pulpal irritation. Now once the pulp is irritated, what happens is inflammation will happen. So once inflammation sets in, it can be either reversible or irreversible. Reversible is in the initial stages. So if we give a treatment at this point, we may lead to the repair of pulp. So at this time, the treatment given is known as vital pulp therapy. If it becomes irreversible, then we go to near pulpal necrosis. Now we have to just do the root canal therapy. Vital pulp therapy is ineffective now. So now there are various factors that affect the dental caries. First is the type of decay. If it is an acute decay, then it is more destructive. While a chronic decay is usually slow, so there is more chance of substantial repair. Second thing is the duration of decay. If the acute decay is for the longer period of time, then there will be more destruction. But if the chronic decay is for more longer period of time, then there we get more time of repair also. Then we have the depth of the decay. So for depth of decay, if the caries is very deep, so the source of irritation will be nearer to the pulp. It will lead to pulp destruction. Another thing is tooth resistance. Tooth resistance depends on the permeability of the involved dentine and the solubility of the involved dentine. Now one more important factor is the effective depth or remaining dentine thickness. It is basically the thickness of the healthy dentine between the pulpal floor and the roof of the pulp chamber. So if there is enough remaining dentine thickness, it forms as a protection barrier any, against any mechanical in, uh, injury or inflammatory products. So if it is 2 mm or more, that means there is a healthy reparative reaction. If it is around 0.8 to 2 mm, then there is unhealthy reparative reaction. Less than 0.3 to 0.8 mm, it means pulpal destruction has already begun. So now there is also a role of dentine in the repair. So once the caries progresses and demineralizes the dentine, it releases the dentine matrix components. These propagate the breakdown of dentine matrix and other bioactive molecules. These migrate down the dentinal tubules and these will stimulate the formation of de tertiary dentine and other pulpal reparative processes. Now role of pulp in repair. So pulp reacts by a combination of inflammation and promotion of mineralization. The balance between pulpitis and repair is very critical when we want to preserve the pulp vitality. So pulp has a complex series of antibacterial, immune, vascular and localized inflammatory responses. So once they are activated, the odontoblast which form the primary dentine during the tooth development and later the secondary dentine, they can form the tertiary dentine also if there is some challenge. So this tertiary dentine will form alongside inflammation locally and beneath the area of the challenge only. So now this tertiary dentine formation can either happen through a reactionary dentinogenesis or through a reparative dentinogenesis. 
So in case of reactionary dentinogenesis, very mild stimulus is there. This mild stimulus leads to a very low grade of inflammation. So this low grade of inflammation doesn't actually kill the odontoblasts. It just injures them and increases the odontoblastic secretory activity. So now this uh, secretory activity will lead to the formation of tertiary dentin. This type of dentinogenesis is reactionary. While in reparative dentinogenesis, what happens the, the stimulus is very intense. So there is a rapid or intense inflammation. Now the odontoblasts get destroyed. So stem or progenital cells are recruited. They differentiate into odontoblast like cells and then the odontoblastic secretory activity starts and leads to tertiary dentine formation. Now coming to uh, the healing after the uh, pulp exposure. So healing is only possible when there is a formation of continuous hard tissue barrier over the exposure and the, uh, the residual pulp is free of inflammation. However, for proper healing, the treatment outcome should be evaluated both clinically as well as radiographically. Now coming to the diagnosis. So for diagnosis, we can use various tactile and visual examinations. Then we have radiographic methods. Then we have history which is very important, uh, history of pain, etc. We can do percussion and palpation tests and also the exposure uh, is also important like size of exposure, experience of exposure and the amount of hemorrhage. Now before coming to the diagnosis, we should be able to differentiate between the infected and affected dentine. So infected dentine is any soft demineralized dentine that is invaded with the bacteria. It is a very soft leathery tissue which can be flaked easily. It, is, it has irreversible denaturation of collagen. It cannot be remineralized and caries detecting dyes can stain it. So it can be easily removed using a spoon excavator. By affected dentine on the other hand, it is demineralized dentine but it is not invaded by bacteria. It is softer but it doesn't flake easily. Uninterrupted collagen cross-linking is there but it can be remineralized and caries detecting dyes won't stain it. So visual and tactile examination when we do, we can uh, visually see and uh, uh, using spoon excavator differentiate between the uh, infected and affected dentine. Then we have various modalities like caries detection dyes which help in examination. Nowadays we even have diagnotin, diaphotai, quantitative light fluorescence and lasers for this purpose. Now coming to the radiographs, we have RVGs, IOPs, etc. on which we can see the proximity and location of caries, widening of PDL space, the lamina dura whether it is intact or not, dimension of the pulp exposure, then uh, if any sclerotic dentine is there or not and tertiary dentine also. So it is helpful for diagnosis. Now coming to the pain, it is a guiding criteria for the status of pulp dentine organ. So deep caries lesion, the pain is of short duration and indicates lesser degenerative changes in the pulp dentine organ. So to test the pain, we have various pulp vitality tests which can be done using thermal pulp testing which uh, includes the use of hot GP sticks etc. Cold test where we use ice sticks or maybe uh, uh, dry ice etc. And heat, uh, electric pulp testing uh, procedures where we use EPTs. Then pulp exposure is also important. Like uh, if the uh, pulp exposure is uh, pinpoint with no hemorrhage, that means no pulpal inflammation is there and it can be easily repaired. If there is exposure and there is sound dentine at the periphery of exposure and the drop of blood that is accompanied coagulates immediately, it means that there is a healthy repairable pulp dentine organ. Then if there is an exposure with the carious dentine at its periphery, that means there is considerable inflammation but still it is repairable. Now if the exposure is with profuse hemorrhage which can't be controlled, that means a greater involvement of pulp has already happened. So now it is an irreparable pulp dentine organ. So now the various modalities are, if there is no exposure, we can go ahead with indirect pulp capping. But if pulpal exposure is there, so we need to see if the pulp is still vital, we can go ahead with a direct pulp capping. If it is non-vital or uh, with severe hemorrhage which cannot be controlled, we have to go ahead with root canal therapy. 
Now, uh, with the recent advances that uh, involve KD's removal are KD Solve and Smart Prep instrument. So, KD Solve is basically a chemo mechanical KD removal method. It involves the use of a gel that attacks all the carious dentine and softens it. Once it is softened, the carious dentine can be easily removed by the use of an excavator and healthy dentine is not removed in this case. So the patients perceive this method as much more comfortable and it saves time and also any unnecessary healthy dental tissue is not uh, removed. Second thing is smart prep instrument. This instrument is a polymer instrument that very safely and effectively removes the decayed dentine but as soon as it comes in contact with the healthy dentine, it will become blunt and it won't cut the healthy dentine. So it will be very minimally invasive and there will be no harm to the healthy tooth structure. And also there has been uh, noted reduced post-operative sensitivity. Now coming to indirect pulp capping. Indirect pulp capping is defined as the procedure where the deepest layer of remaining affected carious dentine is covered with a layer of biocompatible material in order to prevent pulpal exposure and further trauma to the pulp. Now the various indications are when the patient gives history of mild discomfort, negative history of spontaneous pain, then uh, there is a large carious lesions with absence of any lymphadenopathy etc. And in radiographic uh, there is normal lamina dura and pedial space with no interradicular or periradicular radiolicency. Contraindications are when the patient has a history of sharp penetrating pain, particularly at night, or there is excessive tooth mobility, discoloration, etc. And when the radiographic examination shows large carious lesions with uh, a periapical abscess, widening of pedial space, and radiolucency at apical or percal areas. So, this can be either done in a two appointment technique or in a single appointment technique. In two appointment technique, we will first administer LA, uh, isolate the tooth with a rubber dam, remove all the caries, Remo uh, the caries removal should be done first from the periphery, then from the deeper part. Once the caries removal is done, we will uh, irrigate the cavity, dry it with cotton pellets and uh, we will then cover the remaining affected dentine with a hard setting calcium hydroxide. Then we will fill it with a temporary restoration to achieve a good seal and we won't disturb this for 6 to 8 weeks. At second sitting, that is 6 to 8 weeks later, first thing we need to check a radiograph to see how much uh, repetitive dentine is formed. If it is adequate, we can go ahead and uh, again give LA, rubber dam isolation, remove all the temporary filling and the calcium hydroxide dressing. We should not uh, disturb the pre-dentine which appears as dehydrated and flaky dentine. So, uh, if we remove that, then our further uh, demineralization of dentine might be disturbed. Then it should be irrigated and gently dried and the entire floor should be covered with hard setting calcium hydroxide followed by a liner and the tooth should be given a final restoration. As we can see, the procedure is described in the images. Now coming to the one appointment technique in this, once we establish the remove the infected dentine, we can just place the, uh, we can clear, clean the affected dentine and cover the entire floor with a hard setting calcium hydroxide dressing. Then we can place a uh, resin liner or a resin modified GIC liner. Then we can give a final restoration. And if the proper seal is there and patient is symptom asymptomatic after 3 to 8 weeks, no re-entry is attempted. Now coming at direct pulp capping. So direct pulp capping is basically treatment of an exposed vital pulp by sealing the pulpal wound with a dental material placed directly on a mechanical or traumatic exposure to facilitate the formation of preparative dentine and maintenance of vital pulp. So the indications will uh, be where uh, there is an iatrogenic exposure, no history of spontaneous pain, vital pulp, normal radiographic findings, controlled hemorrhage and clean and uncontaminated uh, wound. Then contraindications are where the pain is very spontaneous, there are large carious exposures, then calcifications in pulp chamber is are seen, or excessive hemorrhage which can't be controlled, and exposures with purulent or serous exudates. So direct pulp capping uh, techniques can be either a calcium hydroxide technique or total edge technique. In this first we will give uh, proper hemostasis is achieved, we should control the bleeding. 
Once the bleeding is controlled, we'll disinfect the cavity, place the calcium hydroxide, on that we'll place a glass ionomer liner and followed by the restoration. Either we can do the final restoration in the same sitting or we can give an intermediate restoration. Wait for some time. If patient is asymptomatic, give the final restoration. Then various pulp capping agents can be used. Nowadays we are uh, using MTA, biodentine, calcium enriched mixtures, bioactive glasses, etc. which have shown really good results for uh, DPCs and pulpotomies. Now coming to pulpotomy. Pulpotomy is the procedure in which the exposed coronal vital pulp is surgically removed as a means of preserving the vitality and function of the remaining radicular portion. So the various indications are caries removal which results in pulp exposure especially in a primary tooth with reversible pulpitis. A radicular tissue is judged to be vital with its suppuration and hemorrhage that can be controlled. Contraindications will be when there is resorption seen or there is marked tenderness to percussion, there is mo uh, mobility or there are persistent toothaches and coronal pus. Now coming to the classification, this uh, pulpotomy can be classified on the basis of the amount of tissue that is removed. If uh, only small amount of coronal tissue is removed then we call it as partial pulpotomy. Maybe only the pulp horn area is removed and uh, if full coronal pulp is removed then we call it as complete pulpotomy. So based on the medicaments employed we have calcium hydroxide pulpotomy, MTA pulpotomy, formocrisol pulpotomy etc. Now coming to the clinical procedure in pulpotomy, first step is we'll anesthetize the patients, remove all the caries proper, which should be done in under proper isolation, excess should be gained, pulp tissue should be removed from the coronal part and we should make sure that the bleeding is controlled using hypochlorite which can be used in a concentration of from somewhere between 1.25 to 5 percent. Then we can remove the cotton pellet and confirm the pulp fixation by black eye appearance of the pulp stumps. After that we can place the medicament which can be formocrisol which is now not uh, used too much but now we are using more MTA, biodentine etc. Then we will give a proper coronal seal using a liner followed by the temporary restoration or a permanent seal. Then patient is recalled and kept under observation. So we, there are various factors which affect the prognosis of the direct pulp capping. So first thing is the area of exposure site of exposure, if there was any bacterial contamination or not, duration, then uh, what if any micro leakage is present or not. So uh, now coming to the clinical decision making charge uh, for management of pulp exposure. So if the pulp is not exposed, it's a very clear indication that we have to go for indirect pulp capping. But if pulp is exposed, how to decide whether we should do a DPC or a pulpotomy, partial or complete. So in that case, we need to see the site, uh, size of exposure. If the size is small, then we can go ahead with direct pulp capping and the partial pulpotomy. If it is large enough, then we have to go for complete pulpotomy or pulpectomy. Then duration of hemorrhage is also important. If we can control the hemorrhage in less than 10 minutes, we can go ahead with uh, direct pulp capping or the partial pulpotomy. If it is more than 10 minutes, then it means complete pulpotomy. If it can't be controlled, then pulpectomy is needed. So now once the treatment is done, it is very important to determine if it was successful or not. So how will we determine if the treatment is successful? So the criteria is, main criteria is that maintenance of pulp vitality should be there. Patient should not have any sensitivity or pain. There should be a minimum inflammatory response and there should be absence of radiographic signs of any dystrophic changes and there should be a formation of dentinal bridge. For, uh, in case of a successful pulp, pulp capping. So to conclude, the ultimate goal of vital pulp therapy is to maintain the vitality and function of pulp dentin complex. For further understanding of the process of inflammation, repair, material interaction, etc., it is important to deepen the understandings and to develop novel diagnostic and therapeutic solutions for the same. These are our references. Thank you. Thank you.